Section one of National Geographic Magazine, Volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Discoverers of America, Annual Address by the President, Honorable Gardiner G. Hubbard, presented before the Society, January thirteenth, eighteen ninety-three. Part one. It is appropriate that we should take as the theme of our annual address for the year 1892 the discoverers of America. The discovery of America was the work, not of one explorer, but of many, carried on during a long series of years, beginning with the Northmen, continued by Columbus, Vespucius, Magellan, and Drake, and ending only with the nineteenth century. Before we speak of the discoverers, let us hastily review the condition of the old world prior to the discovery of the new. Two thousand years ago, philosophers generally believed the world to be round, and the most noted of ancient geographers, Eratosthenes, computed its circumference at 25,200 geographic miles. The true figure is 21,600 geographic miles, or 24,899 English miles. Ptolemy, two hundred years later, estimated it at 18,000 geographic miles, and made a series of 26 maps showing the equator and the zones north of the equator, with parallels of latitude and meridians of longitude. As his baseline was too short, and his knowledge of places was generally derived only from seamen who had no accurate means of determining distances, his maps, though showing most of the countries of Europe, Asia, and northern Africa, plate 1, were inaccurate, and unreliable, though vastly superior to those of a later date. These maps were either lost sight of, or so changed by the pictorial extravagances of the map-makers of succeeding ages as to be of little value. Plates 2 and 4. St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and other fathers of the Church believed the earth to be a vast plain. They said with Isaiah that the heaven which embraces the universe is a vault, with Job, that it is joined to the earth, and with Moses, that the length of the earth is greater than its breadth. This, they insisted, was the teaching of the word of God, and must be accepted. Those who believed that the world might be round declared that there could be no inhabitants on the other side, for that Christ said, All tribes of the earth shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory. The famous bull of Alexander the Sixth published in 1493, which gave all newly discovered land 100 leagues west of the Azores to the Spaniards, and east of that line to Portugal, implied that the earth was a plain. For 1500 years, science and the church were in opposition as to the shape of the earth, and there were very few, whatever might be their convictions, who dared question the infallibility of the church. Thus all progress in natural science was checked, and geography and map-making practically ceased to exist. Early in the fourteenth century Marco Polo's book of travels appeared. This greatly increased geographic knowledge, and had a direct and strong bearing on the discovery of America. In the preceding century the father and uncle of Marco Polo, merchants of Venice, made two journeys to the court of the great Khan Kublai in eastern China. On the second journey Marco Polo accompanied his father and uncle. They went by Persia, over the Pamir Mountains, through Turkestan, across the great desert of Gobi, and through Mongolia to China. There they resided for many years, sent by the Khan on several missions, and occupying important positions. On their return they sailed through the China Sea and Indian Ocean to India, stopping at the Philippine and Spice Islands, Sumatra and Ceylon. From India they traveled by land through Persia and Asia Minor and by the Black and Mediterranean Seas, to Venice. Soon after his return, Marco Polo was taken prisoner by the Genoese, and during his captivity wrote an accurate description of the countries through which he traveled, and in which he had lived so many years, and of the islands of Sipango, or Japan, with its inexhaustible riches of gold and pearls, five hundred miles east of China. He also described the voyages of the Chinese to the islands of the Pacific, to Ceylon, and to India, and of the rich trade carried on by the Mohammedans between the Spice Islands, 
India, and the Mediterranean. These travels became gradually known to geographers, and in the 15th century gave a new impulse to geographic study. About the same time the old maps of Ptolemy, which had been hopelessly obscured by the graphic fancies of the cosmographers of the Dark Ages, were, with his writings, brought from the east to Italy. The maps of the Dark Ages showed the Mediterranean and the countries around it, Arabia, Persia, Media, Gog, and Magog, and a little of northern Africa, but so vaguely and incorrectly that today one would scarcely recognize these countries on existing maps. Toscanelli, an Italian, prepared a map about 1474, taking the travels of Marco Polo as his guide. On other maps, Cathay, or China, had been delineated as east of Europe. Toscanelli's transferred it to the west. His map shows the Atlantic Ocean, Sipango, 100 degrees west of Europe, and still further westward, Cathay. He sent a copy of this map to the King of Portugal, and subsequently another to Columbus, urging him to make his contemplated voyage to the land where the spices are born, where the temples and royal palaces are covered with planks of gold. Plate 3. Let us consider the conditions of Europe at the time of the voyages of the Norsemen to America, and the great changes which were gradually preparing the way for the colonization of America. For nearly one thousand years B.C., the ships of Tyre and Sidon, Alexandria and Greece, sailed through the Mediterranean into the Atlantic Ocean as far as Britain. The early sailors were more adventurous, and their ships more seaworthy, than those of Columbus. But as the mariner's compass was not known, they rarely ventured out of sight of land. When Rome became the imperial city commerce, as well as dominion and authority, centered in Rome, and with her decline and fall shipping and commerce disappeared from the Mediterranean, then, far away in the north of the Baltic Sea, the Northmen began to sail the ocean, not for discovery or commerce, but to plunder and ravage richer communities than their own. The Vikings became noted as bold rovers of the sea, pillaging every country they could reach by water. Sailing southwestward, they landed on the coast of France and made a permanent settlement in Normandy. They coasted along the shores of France and Spain, plundering as they went. Passing the Pillars of Hercules into the Mediterranean, they ravaged the coast of Italy and established colonies in southern Italy and Sicily. Sailing westward, they conquered and colonized the eastern coast of England and Scotland, the Shetland, Orkney, and Faroe Islands, and from these islands, in A.D. 850, they sailed 300 or 400 miles northwestward to Iceland, where they made settlements which have continued until our day. One of the early settlers of Iceland was driven by adverse winds to Greenland, where he was compelled to winter, returning in the spring with an account of his discovery. About 986, Eric the Red, an outlaw, fled from Iceland with a few friends to Greenland. Prevented by the icebergs from landing on the eastern coast, they sailed around Cape Farewell to the western coast, where they founded two small colonies near Juliansburg, which existed for four hundred years until forgotten and neglected by the mother country, overcome by want and hunger, they succumbed to the climate and the attacks of the Eskimo. Shortly after Eric had colonized Greenland, Bjarni, another Northman, sailing for Greenland, was driven by northeasterly winds, continuing for many days far southwestward to a land covered with dense woods. There was every reason to believe that this was America, and that Bjarni was its first discoverer. It was not the land of ice and glaciers he was seeking, so he sailed northeastward again, and in ten days reached Greenland. Leif Erikson, one of the Norse Vikings, hearing of this land of woods, about the year 1000, sailed from Greenland in search of it. Passing the barren coasts of Labrador and Newfoundland, which he called Heluland, his party reached Nova Scotia, or Markland, and sailed southward to a place where they found grapes and hence called it Vinland. They were surprised at the length of the winter days, which were nine hours long. The natives they described resembling our Indians, and not the Eskimo of northern latitudes, and from these statements, and the calculation of latitude from the length of the day, it is believed that it was New England. There they founded the colony of Norumbega, but after a few years it was abandoned, as the settlers were unable to withstand the attacks of the natives. 
all original records of the discovery of vinland have perished and our present knowledge is derived from the sagas of the northmen written at least one or two generations after vinland had been abandoned these legends bear the impress of truth and there is no reasonable doubt that leif ericsson was a real character and vinland his discovery the sagas were lost or laid away and forgotten in the libraries of norway and sweden in our days some of them have been unearthed and we know more of the work of leif ericsson and his northmen than was ever known before this discovery was not known beyond greenland and iceland except to a few men in scandinavia for this was the darkest age in the history of europe when the northmen were making their settlement in greenland peter the hermit appeared in southern europe mustering his forces for the first of those crusades which in their ultimate results accomplished a work of vastly greater importance than the redemption of the holy places from the mohammedans the transportation of pilgrims to and from the holy land gave employment to the ships of venice and genoa and restored commerce to the mediterranean their vessels brought the treasures of the orient and the science and art of greece and asia minor to venice and genoa whence they were distributed through italy and europe the feudal system was broken down and the renaissance brought in europe awoke from the long sleep of the dark ages to a new life and energy progress in art and science became rapid and the world entered upon an era of invention and discovery by the middle of the fifteenth century brunelleschi had finished the duomo at florence where savonarola was preaching and michelangelo was studying faust and gutenberg were inventing movable types at frankfurt upon which the bible the first book ever issued from the printing press was printed gunpowder and the mariner's compass were just coming into use in european countries though both had been discovered earlier in england the wars of the roses were over henry the seventh was king and with him the reign of the tudors and the prosperity of england commenced in spain ferdinand and isabella were preparing for that war with the moors which resulted in their expulsion from the spanish dominion in eastern europe the turks had a short time before captured constantinople and destroyed nearly all the commerce of venice and florence and were now raising an army to ravage austria and hungary in portugal prince henry the navigator was making those voyages to the coast of africa for discovery and trade which made portugal for one hundred and fifty years the greatest maritime nation of the world each year these expeditions sailed further and further southward passing the gold coast the equator the river congo they sailed out into the ocean and rediscovered the azores madeira and the canary islands formerly known to the phoenicians in fourteen forty two their ships brought home african negroes to be sold as slaves in lisbon the beginning of the african slave trade in fourteen eighty six diaz rounded the southern extremity of africa and called it the stormy cape though prince henry named it the cape of good hope greater discoveries were made during the lives of men contemporary with columbus than in all times previous or subsequent columbus is for us the principal figure in this new world he was born in italy about fourteen forty six although we know with certainty neither the place nor the time of his birth and but little of his early life he followed the sea for many years sailing to africa england and probably iceland about the year fourteen seventy he is found in portugal where some say he was shipwrecked on the coast while on a piratical voyage here he married a portuguese lady whose father had been governor of one of the islands off the coast of africa and there he resided for several years making maps and pursuing those studies which fitted him for his greatest voyage of discovery he knew that the spices from the islands of the indian ocean the silks diamonds and pearls of india were carried by the arabs through the red sea or up the euphrates in boats and thence by caravans to the mediterranean and black seas where they were exchanged with the merchants of venice and genoa for the goods of europe he was convinced by the study of marco polo not only of the wealth of Sipango and cathay and of the great trade between the orient and the mediterranean but also of the possibility of reaching those countries and obtaining that trade for spain by sailing west rather than by circumnavigating africa the actual distance from europe in a due west line to Sipango is nearly twelve thousand miles toscanelli estimated it at one hundred degrees or nearly five thousand miles but his map showed islands on the route which would reduce the distance between any two lands to about two thousand miles 
Columbus was a devout Catholic, holding to the teachings of the Church. In the book of Esdras, he read that God on the third day of the creation made the earth, six parts of land and one-seventh water. He knew the vast extent of the Atlantic north and south, and reasoning from these facts, he thought it could not be over two thousand or twenty-five miles to Sipango, though he actually sailed three thousand two hundred and thirty miles before he reached a new world. After Columbus determined to cross the Atlantic, he applied for help to the king of Portugal. He wrote, They took my charts and writings from me, saying they would ponder them, but secretly they sent out the ships they had denied me. God drove them back on their own coasts and punished their treachery, but I could no longer trust them. He therefore left Portugal for Spain. Las Casas describes him at this time as a man of noble and commanding presence, tall and well-built, with a ruddy complexion, keen blue-gray eyes that often kindled, while his waving white hair made him quite picturesque, his manner courteous and his conversation charming. He had an indefinable air of authority, as became a man of great heart and lofty thoughts. It was this commanding presence which enabled him to stand before Ferdinand and Isabella as their equal. In 1484 he arrived in Spain, a foreigner, poor and in debt. A stranger and friendless, he appeared at the court of the proudest sovereigns of Europe. Yet such was his bearing, and the effect produced upon the king and queen by his eloquence, that they appointed several learned men to consider his project. Some few believed, many remained in doubt, but most laughed at him as visionary and ridiculed his proposals as the dream of a madman. Those that were convinced by his reasoning became his firm friends. For seven years he waited patiently at the courts, renewing his suit from time to time, until Granada was conquered, when Isabella had promised to listen to him. A man less confident, less in earnest, would have succumbed before the many difficulties and delays he encountered. Again he applied to Isabella, and she agreed to equip a fleet. Columbus demanded that he should be made High Admiral of the Western Seas, and Viceroy and Governor of all the continents and islands which might lay therein, and that he should receive one-eighth of the net profits from all trade with such countries. Isabella refused, but Columbus, knowing that the discovery of a new and shorter route to the Spice Islands would give Spain the control of their trade, and realizing the power and wealth that would accrue to the Spanish throne through such discovery, insisted on his demands, and for this great constancy and loftiness of soul Las Casas commends him. After this refusal, Columbus mounted his mule and started for France, but was soon recalled. He returned to the court which agreed to his demands. A patent was granted appointing Christopher Colon, as soon as he shall have discovered said islands or mainlands in the ocean sea, or any one of them, to be our admirable of the ocean sea, viceroy and governor, in the said islands or mainland, I the queen, I the king. The fleet of Columbus was three small vessels, the largest a single-decked ship ninety feet long, the others with decks only in the stern and prow. His crew was ninety men. On August 6, 1492, they sailed from Palos, and on October 21st they discovered the Indies. Columbus returned to Spain and appeared at the court of Isabella with his train of Indians bearing gold, silver, and precious stones, and other products of the islands he had discovered. It was Cathay, and the shorter route to the Indies he supposed he had found, though he did not find the cities and rich countries of gold and silver, the pearls and jewels that he sought. He thought these treasures lay further westward, and that he must find the Straits of Malacca, and through them sail to the Spice Islands in India, and for that purpose he sailed on his second voyage, and after following the coast of Cuba one thousand miles, believing he had found the continent of Asia, returned to Spain. Ferdinand and Isabella gave many persons the right to visit the newly discovered lands, as was their prerogative, but they also appointed governors over the land and water, contrary to their agreement with Columbus. On his third voyage, in 1498, he reached South America, the first European to discover that continent. He found a large bay and thought he had reached the Straits. But alas, the waters were fresh. It was only the Orinoco River. He coasted for some distance along the shore of the Caribbean Sea, still looking for the Straits, and then set sail for Hispaniola, or Cuba, where he had left his brother governor. On arriving he found his brother deposed and imprisoned. Columbus himself was put in chains and sent home. The captain of the vessel offered to remove his chains, but he refused, 
saying that they had been put on by order of the king and could be removed only by him while columbus was vainly searching in the new world for the orient vasco da gama found it for portugal in fourteen ninety seven by sailing around the cape of good hope and crossing the indian ocean to india and the spice islands he returned to lisbon bearing all manner of precious stones silks and satins and spices of every kind columbus for the time was forgotten and it was only after a long detention that he was permitted again to sail towards the western world on his fourth and last voyage columbus landed at honduras followed the coast of nicaragua and the isthmus of panama and then sailed along the caribbean sea vainly searching for the straits that would lead him to the promised land on his return from this voyage the queen his friend was dead and their last eighteen months of his life were spent in poverty and sickness at valladolid where he died in fifteen o six so little known that local records of the city which give many insignificant details make no mention of his death after columbus had opened the way it was easy for other navigators to follow where he had led two other italians john cabot and sebastian his son sailed from england in fourteen ninety seven nearly due west for cathay they discovered newfoundland and sailed thence northwestward along the coast of labrador and were probably the first discoverers of the continent of america the next year they made another voyage to newfoundland and then followed the coast of north america southward probably reaching the carolinas these voyagers still seeking cathay and the spice islands cared little for a land of hills and rocks where neither gold nor silver was found Two generations pass before we hear of any further English expeditions to the New World. The most noted of the followers of Columbus was Americus Vespucius, like Columbus and the Cabots, an Italian, a pilot of great reputation, sailing in the service of Portugal. In 1497 he sailed around the Gulf of Mexico, Honduras, Mexico and Florida, and thence along the coast of North America, nearly to Chesapeake Bay. On another voyage he sailed to South America, reaching it a little north of Cape St. Roque. He followed the coast nearly to the mouth of the Rio de la Plata, taking possession of the country for the King of Portugal. Vespucius knew that this country was south of every part of Asia, and therefore could not be a part of the world as then known. He realized that he had discovered a new world. An account of this voyage was published in German, Italian, and French, with the title in the French edition, Novus Mundus. In a map published in 1514, it was called America. Thus the name of Americus Vespucius was given to the New World, and he received the honor due to Columbus. It was said that Columbus had discovered new islands, Vespucius a new world. That world already discovered by Northmen, then by Columbus, the third time by Cabot, and now by Americus Vespucius. End of section 1《セクション2 of National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Discoverers of America by the Honorable Gardiner G. Hubbard. Part 2. After Columbus, Magellan was the greatest of the discoverers of America. Born of a noble Portuguese family, he early entered the naval service and sailed to India, where for seven years he was employed on land and on sea in laying the foundation of the Portuguese empire. He gained a great reputation for his services and returned to Lisbon. Disappointed in an application to the king of Portugal, he went to Spain, where Charles V gladly received him and gave him the command of a fleet of five vessels, in which he set sail for India and the Spice Islands. Magellan, like Columbus and Vespucius, hoped to find a way to India through some strait dividing South America, or, failing in that, by sailing around the mainland. He left Spain in 1518 for Brazil, sailing then southwardly along the coast to about fifty degrees south, where he spent the winter. Three of his captains became discouraged, mutinied, and determined to return. Magellan heard of their treachery. He summoned the leader to his vessel. On his refusal to obey, the officer bearing the summons plunged a dagger into the heart of the mutineer. At the same moment, 
a boat's crew from Magellan's vessel mounted the deck, and the mutiny was over. The other mutineers were either hung or left to perish on the coast of Patagonia. Early in the spring of 1519 the fleet set out again, one vessel having been shipwrecked, and found a channel which proved to be the long-sought passage to India. Three months were spent in exploring the Straits of Magellan before they entered the Pacific Ocean. One of the vessels sent to explore a channel in the Straits deserted and returned to Spain. They sailed along the coast of Patagonia four hundred or five hundred miles, and then northeastward toward Cathay and the Spice Islands. The wind was light, the ocean was as calm and smooth as an island sea, and they called it the Pacific Ocean. For months their progress was slow, their food failed, scurvy and sickness broke out. Finally they reached the Ladrone Islands and found the food and rest they so much needed. They then sailed for the Philippine Islands, where in a foolish affray with the natives Magellan was killed. But he had finished his work, he had circumnavigated the globe, he had reached the east by sailing west. One of the three vessels which had crossed the Pacific was abandoned and burned in the Philippine Islands, another was lost in the Malaccas. The last, loaded with spice, returned to Spain and finished the most remarkable voyage on record. Of the 280 men who sailed with Magellan in September 1519, only eighteen returned in September 1522. The cost of this fleet, with all its equipment, was about twenty thousand dollars, less than one half of the cost of the steamer plying between Washington and Mount Vernon. The sale of the spices left a large profit to Charles V and the merchants who had furnished the funds for the adventure. The King of Spain gave the heirs of Ferdinand Magellan for their coat of arms a terrestrial globe belted with the legend, Primus circumdedisti me, thou first encompassed me. In 1513, Vasco Nunez Balboa, a Spaniard who had married an Indian princess, heard, from the natives, of the Pacific Ocean and of the land of the Incas, where gold, silver, and precious stones abounded. On September 25th, from the top of the mountains, he looked down on the Pacific Ocean, the first European to behold it. He collected a few vessels on the Atlantic coast for a voyage of discovery to Peru, and, taking them to pieces, he carried them across the isthmus and launched them on the Pacific. Two thousand Indians, we are told, perished in this work. When nearly ready to sail, he was recalled by the governor of Darien and beheaded. After the death of Balboa, Francisco Pizarro, one of his followers, returned to Spain with an account of the land of the Incas, and in 1529 was made governor and captain-general of this country, then called the province of New Castile, with leave to fit out at his own expense an expedition to conquer that territory. He left Panama with three ships, 180 men, and 27 horses, but it was not until two years later that they landed in Peru, and began that contest which resulted in the overthrow of the Incas, and in loading with riches the meanest of Pizarro's followers. The civilization of the Incas, the highest type in America, was crushed. The Spaniards soon after this conquest sailed still further southward, along the coast of Peru and Chile, even to the Straits of Magellan. Rumors of an El Dorado beyond the Andes came to Pizarro. One of his followers, Orolano, was sent to cross the Andes and descend to the headwaters of the Amazon, but he could not find the promised land. His party, famished and decimated by the fatigue of the journey, and unable to return to the Pacific, built a boat and floated down the Amazon River four thousand miles to its mouth. Before the discovery of Peru by Pizarro, Sebastian Cabot, with a small Spanish fleet, in 1527, sailed up the Rio de la Plata to the great falls of the Parana. He found some silver and gold mines in Brazil, and heard of the civilization and riches of the Incas of Peru, but was unable to cross the mountains to their country. Thus, within fifty years after the discovery of America, South America had been circumnavigated, its great rivers navigated, and the general features of the interior and its treasures of gold and silver made known to the Spaniards and the Portuguese. Some time before the conquest of Peru, the Spaniards heard rumors of the great city of the Montezumas. In March, 1519, Hernando Cortez, one of the most daring and able of the adventurous Spaniards, landed on the coast of Mexico with ten vessels, six hundred to seven hundred soldiers, eighteen horsemen, and some cannon. He burnt his ships, 
thus cutting off all retreat, and then marched toward the city of Mexico. By his courage, address, and strategy, he conquered, or made friends, of several tribes of Indians hostile to Montezuma. He pushed onward to the city of Mexico, where he was received with great pomp by Montezuma and escorted into the city as his friend and guest. Soon after Cortez, learning that Montezuma was preparing to attack the invaders, visited him in his palace, and by persuasion and force took him to the Spanish quarters and kept him a prisoner. Some time later the Indians chose another king and attacked the Spaniards, but after a slight success were defeated with great loss. Then Cortez, having captured and fortified the city of Mexico, defeated the other tribes and subdued the whole country. He subsequently explored it to the Gulf of California and Lower California, on the other side of the Gulf. He then returned to Spain, but was not received by Charles V as he expected. Forcing his way to the royal presence, Cortez replied to Charles, who wished to know who the intruder was, I am the man who has given you more provinces than your father left you cities. There is no tale in the history of the world more marvelous than the conquest of Peru and Mexico, when we consider the high culture and strength of the natives, the small number of Europeans engaged, the extent of the conquests, and the value of the treasures obtained. The Spanish discoverers of America were men of marked ability, capable of enduring privations of every kind, prompt in action, prepared for every emergency, proud, brave, and self-reliant to the verge of rashness, eager for adventures, cruel, unscrupulous, and rapacious, of unbounded greed and ambition. They sought and found gold and silver in Peru and Mexico in such quantities as they had never dreamed of. The New World brought to Spain greater wealth and glory than Columbus ever expected to find in Cathay or the Spice Islands. Spain, it is said, drew from America during the sixteenth century seven hundred millions of dollars in gold and silver, a sum fully equal to ten times as much in purchasing power at the time as it would be today. In the exploration of North America the Spaniards took little interest. What need have we, they said, of things which are common to all the countries of Europe? To the south, to the south of the great and exceeding riches of the equinoctial. They that seek riches must not go into the cold and frozen north. The French, though they made some remarkable journeys in the continent of North America, furnished but one discoverer whom we shall notice. Jacques Cartier, a French navigator who was appointed in 1534 by Francis I to the command of two ships for exploring the district near the fishing grounds of Newfoundland. He sailed up the St. Lawrence and took possession of Canada for France, erecting a wooden cross with the inscription, Viva la Roy de France. In 1541, a settlement was made near Quebec, the commencement of the French colonization in Canada. The English were far behind the Spanish and Portuguese in the exploration of America. Their first great voyagers after the Cabots were slavers, buccaneers, and pirates. Their most noted commanders were John Hawkins and Francis Drake, who carried a cargo of Negro slaves from Africa to the West Indies and sold them at an enormous profit. They there heard of the Spanish galleons bearing the treasures of Peru and Mexico to Spain, and of the cruelties with which English seamen taken prisoners had been treated. On their return, fleets were equipped and sent to the Gulf of Mexico to capture the treasure ships and avenge the wrongs of the English sailors. The Queen frequently furnished ships belonging to the Royal Navy. They were equipped by Raleigh and other English noblemen, and the prizes were divided between the crew, officers, nobles, and Queen, the Queen obtaining the largest share. Sir Francis Drake, one of the boldest and most successful of these cruisers, on one trip overhauled and plundered over two hundred vessels and pillaged towns and cities. Several times Philip II of Spain demanded his surrender as a pirate, for during all this time the two nations were at peace. The queen hesitated and delayed, but never yielded to the demand. There and then the foundation was laid of the navy and seamen of Great Britain. In 1577 Drake was summoned to a private audience with the queen, at which it was agreed that a fleet of five ships would be equipped nominally for the Mediterranean, but really for the South Seas, as the Pacific Ocean was then called, to capture the great galleons, the treasure ships of Spain, and that the Queen should contribute one thousand crowns to the cost. On August twentieth, 1578, Drake, with this fleet, reached the Straits of Magellan, and sailed through them in two weeks into the Pacific. There they encountered long and terrific storms, which carried them far south of the Straits. 
one of drake's vessels had been broken up for firewood another swamped in his sight and the third deserted and returned to england on the fifty-third day of the tempest drake found himself south of cape horn where no other vessel had ever sailed here according to all the maps was the great austral continent which extended an unbroken land area from the straits of magellan to the antarctic pole but he found only water before him rolled the waters of the atlantic and pacific in one great flood he walked to the end of the farthest island lay down and with his arms embraced the southernmost ground of the new world then the weather changed and all went well he sailed along the coast of south america captured valparaiso took all the treasures he could find refitted and provisioned his ships and sailed northward taking treasure ships and plundering cities until his vessel could carry no more although it was ballasted with silver and gold instead of returning as he had come drake determined to seek and find the fabulous strait so long sought by columbus and by that channel find his way home he followed the coast from central america northward to the latitude of vancouver and took possession of the land for england calling it new albion then finding the coast still trending to the northwestward and the weather growing more and more severe he gave up his attempt landed at the harbor of san francisco refitted his ships and returned home by the cape of good hope reaching plymouth in september fifteen eighty the second man to circumnavigate the world what his reception would be at home was questionable the news of his exploits had reached spain the year before and the ambassador of philip demanded that he should be executed as a pirate and renewed the demand as soon as he heard of the explorer's return the result of this demand was for some time doubtful but when it was heard that a spanish hostile fleet had landed on the irish coast the queen determined to support drake and receive her share of the spoils what they were we are not told but they must have been very great as drake's share was ten thousand pounds equal to four hundred thousand dollars of our money to-day this voyage of drake completed the discovery of america from the northern coast of labrador southward around cape horn and northward to forty eight degrees the latitude of vancouver island nearly one hundred years elapsed from the first voyage of columbus to the voyage of drake each of whom vainly sought a way through america the one from the atlantic to the pacific the other from the pacific to the atlantic thus before the end of the sixteenth century the whole continent of america save the arctic border had been circumnavigated and the southern part of it colonized but it was not until after another century and another age that another race found homes for themselves on the coast of north america the voyages of the discoverers of america gradually became known to the public it is interesting and instructive to examine the early maps representing these voyages to see how slowly the geography of the new world became known on the zeni map of fourteen hundred published in fifteen fifty eight greenland is connected with norway the same connection is shown in the claudius clavis map of fourteen twenty seven in the portuguese mapamonde of fourteen ninety and even in the ptolemy map by waltz muller in fifteen thirteen while in the map of europe at the end of the chronicon nurembergensi in fourteen ninety three greenland is shown as an isthmus connecting norway and sweden with russia one of the first maps drawn after the discovery of america was that made in fifteen hundred by juan de la casa a celebrated pilot and cartographer who accompanied columbus on his first and second voyages and vespucius on his first voyage it delineated parts of the eastern coasts of south america and north america showing by the flags of spain england and portugal the coast explored by the ships of each country on that part of the map between north america and south america columbus is drawn as st columbus bearing the christ child on his shoulders the figure thus fulfills a double purpose of honoring columbus and covering the undiscovered portions of the continent on the cantino chart of fifteen o one to fifteen o two south america is delineated as surrounded by water from about thirty degrees south to the isthmus of darien then cuba the west india islands and the coast of north america from thirty seven degrees to fifty four degrees north there is no land connecting north america and south america on the rush map of fifteen o eight two years after the death of columbus greenland and labrador are connected with asia the new world appears as an island near the equator on the lennox globe so called made about the year fifteen ten now in the lennox library in new york 
South America is a large island, while North America is represented by a number of detached islands. On the map attributed to Leonardo da Vinci, 1514, the name America appears for the first time, and is given to a large island on the equator. Florida is the name of another island northwest of America. On the Schoener Globes of 1515 and 1520, North America and South America are two islands, while the southern part of America is separated by straits from the Antarctic continent, and on the globe of 1520 the city of Mexico is identified as Quince of Marco Polo. On the Hauslob globe of 1516 to 1517, the name America is given to South America. Straits connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans separate North America from South America. On the Maiolo map of 1527, South America, including the Isthmus of Panama, appears an island separated by the Strato Cubatoro from North America. On the Munster map of 1532, South America is an island with a strait between it and Cuba, leading to the Pacific Ocean, while on the Munster map of 1540, North America and South America are connected by an isthmus. On the Paris Gilt Globe, about 1525, Greenland is an island, Labrador and Terra Florida form parts of Asia, while the Gulf of Mexico is fairly delineated, with Cathay on its western shore. The Schoener Globe of 1533 is much the same in the middle latitudes, while the Paris Wooden Globe, about 1535, represents Greenland, Labrador, and Florida as belonging to Asia, the Gulf of Mexico as the Mar Catharum, and South America as a peninsular extension of the Asiatic mainland. On the map of Orontius Phineas, 1537, thirty years after the death of Columbus, Greenland is an island, Labrador and the coast of North America are attached to the northern part of Asia, Cathay appears on the Gulf of Mexico, and South America is connected with the southeastern part of Asia. This map was made nearly twenty years after Magellan had circumnavigated the world. On the Gastaldi Carto Marina of 1548, Greenland is connected with Norway on the east, and Labrador with America on the west. North America and South America are connected, and the Austral continent is shown south of the Straits of Magellan. There was no map published until after the 16th century that gave a correct delineation of the seacoast of America. It is no wonder that Columbus never comprehended the nature or extent of his discoveries. The more we study the history and geography of the times, the influence of the church, the difficulty of determining longitude, the ignorance of the movements of the mariner's compass and of the distance to Cipango, the greater will be our admiration for Columbus. Yet a recent writer speaks of the discovery of Columbus as a blunder and others say, as if in disparagement of his work, that he knew of the discoveries of the Northmen, and was only following their track, that the chart of Toscanini which Columbus took on his first voyage indicated clearly his route, that Columbus died in the belief that he had discovered Cipango and Cathay, never realizing that it was the New World, and that Americus Vespucius is entitled to the greater credit. Let us hear the opinion of a contemporary of Columbus, Sebastian Cabot. When news was brought that Don Christopher Colon, the Genoese, had discovered the coasts of India, whereon was great talk in all the court of King Henry the Seventh, who then reigned, all men with great admiration affirmed it to be a thing more divine than humane to sail by the west into the east, where the spices grow, by a chart that was never before known. It is very doubtful if Columbus knew anything of the voyages of the Northmen, nor would such knowledge have been of much value, for Greenland was then believed to be a part of Europe and joined to Norway. If Columbus had known of the discoveries and sought the countries they had found, he would have sailed northwestward instead of westward. Many before Toscanini and Columbus believed the world to be round, and that by sailing westward Asia might be reached, believed but proved it. He made no blunder, for he sought land the other side of the Atlantic, and he found it. Vespucius knew little more than Columbus of the New World, and never realized that North America and South America were one continent. The maps show that learned geographers long after the discoveries of Columbus, Vespucius, Cabot, and Magellan did not understand the geography of the New World. All voyages before that of Columbus had been coasting voyages, the sailors keeping in sight of land. Columbus pushed out into the unknown and trackless ocean, leaving land far behind. Good seamen were unwilling to undertake so terrible a voyage, so convicts were obtained, 
liberated from prison on condition of sailing with Columbus. A brave, resolute, and self-contained spirit was necessary to command such a crew on such an expedition. New wonders startled him each day. The magnetic needle, instead of pointing steadily northward, swerved toward the west. The wind for many days blew unvaryingly from the east, and the sailors thought it would prevent them from returning. The Saragossa Sea puzzled them. They daily grew more timid as they sailed further and further into the ocean, though they had sailed much further than they had supposed. No voyage like that was ever made before, and none like it can ever be made again, for the great discoverer solved the problem and reached the east by sailing west. How like a tragedy the life of Columbus! Twelve years of preparation and waiting, five in Portugal and seven at the court of Isabella, his demand, its rejection, his recall, his departure from Palos with three small vessels, his triumphant return after the discovery of America, admiral and governor, sent home in chains, his death, poor, unknown, and forgotten. Contrast this with what has recently taken place at Palos. Last September, 1892, the greatest warships of the world from Spain, Italy, Germany, Great Britain, and the United States, propelled by a power unknown to Columbus, escorted from the harbor of Palos three little ships, two without decks, fashioned after the ships of Columbus. At the time of Columbus's death, none to honor him. Now all Europe and the New World unite in rendering him the greatest homage ever paid to man. End of section 2